Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Life in the Flower Bed, brought to you by Loudoun County Public Library and the Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy. I'm Lorraine Maffa, Programming Coordinator for Loudoun County Public Library and the host for tonight's program. Please feel free to send me any questions or comments you may have during the program, and I'll be happy to relate into our presenter at the end of her presentation. It's my pleasure to introduce that presenter. Dr. Claire Walker was an education specialist at the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, Wildlife and Heritage Service. She's currently the program manager for the Irvine Nature Center in Owens Mills, Maryland. Her special interest area is native bees and pollinators. Welcome, Claire. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, yes, so I um, have been fascinated by bees, um, native bees, for quite a long time. And I uh, volunteer at the uh, USGS Bee Lab. So the National Bee Lab is actually at Texan Wildlife Refuge. So we're really lucky that it's so close by us. But one of the things I noticed is when I spend a lot of time looking at bees on flowers, how many other really cool uh, animals are also in those flower beds and all the different relationships between them. So this evening, we are gonna talk about the good animals from our point of view, uh, maybe some of the ones that we consider the bad, and then there's definitely some that will be slightly ugly. And um, I was just like laughing because I was listening to the theme tune to the good, the bad, and the ugly, but uh, apparently my sound is not playing, so you just have to imagine it in your head tonight. So when we plant a pollinator garden, nah, uh, you know, our gardens, it's mostly because we do want to support um, butterflies and have them come to our, our gardens and um, help bees. Um, but if you plant flowers, there are actually going to be lots of other things that come. You can't stop the whole web of life that will uh, arrive in your yard. So there will be things like stink bugs and like aphids that also show up in that flower bed. And then there's going to be some other animals that maybe, you know, you don't like being there or maybe you're just like ambivalent about them being there um, because they're things that don't really harm the, the plants. And these particular ones aren't going to harm our butterflies and bees either. Um, but sometimes people aren't, you know as excited to see these animals. But tonight, I'm going to try and get you excited about all of the animals, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So let's just start right back at the beginning, though, because I've talked, the whole talk is about life in a pollinator garden. Um, and I just want to make sure that we all know what that actually means in terms of what is pollination. So this is, goes right back to what we probably did in elementary school, which is pollination is pollen um, produced by the male part of a plant being carried by an animal to um, another plant of the same species um, where that pollen then gets to the female part of that plant. And if that happens, pollination happens. And then uh, the plant becomes fertilized. And the end result of that is why the plants have done this whole process of providing um, nectar treats to draw in pollinators because they want to produce seeds. Um, so the, you know, what's really going on in a pollinator garden is plants are producing seeds. And those seeds will also feed lots of wildlife. And of course, they are completely essential for the plants because they are the next generation of plants as well. So who is it that's doing all this pollination? If we were all sitting in person, which um, would be really fun, I much prefer trying to do uh, talks in person where I get feedback. And I asked, who are our pollinators? I'm almost certain that the first thing that people would say would be the bees. But straight away after that, usually the next most common answer is the flies. So, um, and then the third one, sometimes it's the second, sometimes third that people usually say is the one that uh, we had right at the beginning, the hummingbird. But that's the only um, vertebrate that pollinates in Maryland. So, because we don't have pollinating bats here, all of our bats are insectivores. Um, 
the next from now on it gets to be you know harder for people to think of pollinators but we do have a lot of pollinating moths like this one that's really like got its head right down into this flower and because moths are really hairy um have kind of fuzzy bodies they are really good pollinators um then you might surprise you that a lot of flies are pollinators too but you can see this one has a hairy body then things like beetles can also be pollinators and wasps even can be pollinators but as i said the first one that everyone thinks about is bees and that's because bees have lots of hair on their body they're the ones that are collecting actively collecting the pollen for all the other animals it's just like they accidentally transport pollen but for bees they're actually collecting the pollen because they want to feed their young the pollen um so they have bodies designed to kind of attract and hold pollen and that's what makes them really great pollinators but if i said the word bee to you a lot people's first idea when i say the word bee is actually this bee which is from my homeland which is the european honeybee and they're going to think about honey waggle dances beekeepers keeping those bees but funnily enough, if I asked you or any child to like draw a bee, the bee they draw is this one, which is a bumblebee. And the bumblebee is one of our native bees. Um, and it's one of the bees that I'm going to be talking about a lot today because these are the ones that have lots of interactions with the other animals that you're going to find in your pollinator garden. And the reason that I, uh, a lot of focus is now being paid to what bumblebees, um, among other bees, are up to is because there is has been a noticeable decline in the number of pollinators. So there's some pretty scary figures out there. If you look at this one, which was looked at, this is globally suggesting that butterflies have decreased by uh, about 50% in the last decade um, and bees by almost 50% in the last decade and considering so much of our food is dependent on pollination it's really worrying for our food supplies but it's even more worrying for the reproduction of all the other plants out there because they also need pollinators to get pollinated and um, we're going to see how some of the, the bees, you know, like are very specifically designed to pollinate native plants. So just for a local comparison compared to those, uh, this global figure in Maryland, there were, uh, were 50 known species of um, bumblebee, but of those only five are now still common. Uh, we've lost four of them from the state. One has nearly been lost completely from America and is on the endangered species list. Um, and six of them are considered threatened, um, so that they're, they're fairly rare within the state. So I just give you a bit of a hint that I'm really most interested in native bees. So those honeybees, they're just a single bee species. But in the United States, we have a huge number of native bee species. So any guesses on how many bee species, species there might be in the United States? So I'm going to open my chat so I can see if anyone wants to have any guesses on how many bee species there are. Any guesses? Someone just guessed 4,000. 4,000, that's really good, yep. So it is about 4,000 thousand species in the uh, United States. So that person has really been paying attention. But uh, actually got yes. two, two votes for 4,000. Yep, very <laughs> good. So the next one, the questions are going to get slightly harder each time here is how many bee species uh, do you think there are in Maryland? It's funny, I don't know why I'm not seeing the chat. I think I can fix that. Hold on a second. Okay. Um, someone guesses 400. Yep, 
So it's pretty cool. We Maryland is only 0.4% uh, of the entire land surface of the United States, but we have 10% of all the bee species. So there are about 425 native bee species in Maryland. So as I said, the questions are going to get harder. So any guesses on what you think is the most abundant type or the most abundant species of native bee in Maryland? So by type, that would be like a genus. So it's kind of like the equivalent of saying what's, you know, if I asked you what was the most abundant type of bird, you might guess sparrows or something like that. So that's what I mean by type. And species is obviously an individual species. So any guesses on this one? This is where usually people start to get a bit worried that they uh, might not know the answer. Do you see that? There's, do you see those replies, Claire? No, I've brought, I've brought the chat up, but I'm not. I'm not uh, okay. Seeing. Well, it, um, someone is guessing bumblebee and someone else, the bombus 20. Uh huh. So bombus Sex. and bumblebee. I don't know if it's 20 the, or it's the same, the same species. Um, but uh, no, surprisingly enough, the most common type of bee in Merrill, most abundant type. But actually, the Lassie Glossum, so I was actually giving you a bit of a hint when I said sparrows, because obviously small birds are more abundant than large birds. And the same thing is true with bees. The smallest of our bees are actually the most abundant, because if you're a small thing, you don't need much habitat, so there can be lots of you. In terms of species, this would be like, for, if I asked you for birds, you might know that the most abundant birds are probably starlings, a non-native bird, and then robins, which, you know, just are kind of generalists that can live everywhere. And the equivalent for bees is exactly the same. The most abundant bees, if you just go out in your yard and try and catch them, um, are going to be honeybees, which are the equivalent of starlings. They're a non-native bee that uh, lives here. And then the generalist that can live anywhere is our golden sweat bees. So those are the two most common species of bees. But in that whole diversity of 400 bees that I talk, mentioned, you can find bees that are kind of bluish in color, greenish, reddish, purplish, um, and they vary, you know, so much in how shiny and hairy they are. So we have kind of bees of all different shape and size. And the reason is we have flowers of all different shapes and sizes. So the bees tend to visit particular types of flowers and they have evolved to specialize, you know, so that their body shape and size um, matches the type of flowers that they visit. So if you want an abundance of different types of bees in your yard, you need to plant an abundance of different types of flowers. And just to give you a, a hint of like the range of bees that are out there, a lot of you might know that the largest bee out there is actually the bumblebee. Um, bumblebee? No, it's not. It's the carpenter bee. <laughs> Sorry. So it's this carpenter bee. You can tell the difference from a bumblebee and a carpenter bee because the Carpenter bees have shiny hineys, no hair on their hiney down here. And a carpenter bee is a little bigger than a quarter, okay, in size. Our smallest bees, in comparison, are actually only the size of a carpenter bee's eye. And um, if you look on that same quarter, they're about the length of George Washington's nose on the back of a quarter. So have a look at one of those and you'll see how small they are. So, as I said, if you want this diversity of different types of bees come into your yard, um, you should plant lots of different native flowers that uh, flower at different times of the year and are different shapes and different colors. Um, and then you'll be able to support up to 100 species of bee just in an average backyard. But as I said, it won't just be bees that come to visit. So as soon as you have a large collection of bees, such as this uh, really cute uh, digger bee here. Um, so these are bees that come out in the springtime and they actually like dig little holes in the ground and that's they make the nests for their young in, in burrows under the ground. And in the summertime, so right at the moment, if you have 
uh, native plants in your yard and you have uh, red buds, you might notice like little tiny holes missing from those red bud leaves. And it's actually the leaf cutter bees. So this is inside the home of a leaf cutter bee where they are building a nest for each of their individual um, babies. So they collect pollen and then lay an egg on that. But as soon as you have a large number of bees, you are going to attract other kind of bees called cuckoo bees. So this is a nomada bee, and he specializes on finding the homes of the digger bees, and they'll go down those burrows and lay their eggs in the nest, and then their young get to eat all the pollen. So they don't have to do any work. They uh, just use the, the food that's being collected by uh, um, digger bee. And then uh, this bee, the Celioxis over here, is another type of cuckoo bee, and it specializes in finding the nests of these uh, leaf cutter bees and going into those and uh, you know laying their eggs in there. So both of these bees, um, once you have large numbers of pollinating bees in your yard, you're going to attract these cuckoo bees, and you know they're going to be sneaking into those nests. Now, when we use the word cuckoo, some people kind of like have these associations of someone, but they're cheats. They go into somebody else's nest and take all the food. But those bees, um, if you go back and look at them for a second, you can see these bees don't have any hairs. They actually aren't capable of collecting pollen themselves. So they don't have a choice. It's their biology that they have to you know, live these lifestyles. So as I say, um, as humans, we often apply values to different animals, but um, in reality, all these bees are all part of our bee diversity. About 20% of all bee species are actually cuckoo bees. And they have an important role because they tend to parasitize the nests of the most common bees. And by doing that, they reduce the populations of those like leaf cutter bees and allow rarer bees the opportunity to come in and find food. So they are an important part of the checks and balances of uh, the bee population. Okay, so you've also planted your garden to attract butterflies. Yeah, we all want to see lots of butterflies like this stunning zebra swallowtail um, come to our flowers. But if you can have butterflies, you have to have baby butterflies. And when um, the book, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, was written, it's you know very factually based in terms of how hungry caterpillars are. So caterpillars are the grazers of any you know herbivory. So all the plants in a pollinator garden are going to be eaten considerably by caterpillars. So they in uh, you know like. If we compare a pollinator garden to, say, you know, a Serengeti or something, these are the equivalent of the, you know, zebras and the uh, wildebeest and stuff in that they are out there grazing and grazing. And because of that, there's lots of them and they provide lots of food for other animals. But if we want to have butterflies, we have to have caterpillars. And for this caterpillar, you have to have violet. It's their only host plant. Um, and then they go into these absolutely stunning uh, chrysalis. And out of this chrysalis will appear like fritillary butterflies. So I'll put a couple of different types of our local fritillaries here that you can attract if you have violets in your as part of your pollinator garden. Because the big and that people tend to put into their garden to attract butterflies are the milkweeds because I'm sure most of you know that milkweeds are the host plant for cat, uh, the monarch butterfly. So sometimes people think they're planting these flowers um, so that the butterflies will come and feed, the adults will feed on the flowers, but that's not actually the case. What you plant these flowers for the milkweeds, like the butterfly weed, swamp milkweed, or common milkweed, is so that the leaves can be eaten by these caterpillars, which are also you know, really cool to look at. They have that special aposematic markings to tell birds that they taste 
repairable so they don't get eaten. So this is a warning coloration, all this striping. And they live on uh, the but the milkweed and will really eat a lot of it. So if you want to support uh, monarchs, you have to plant quite a lot of milkweed because they go through a lot of leaves. But if you're lucky, you'll get them coming to your yard and then they turn into these butterflies. And of course, the absolutely amazing thing about the monarchs is that we just get to see them for a short time in the summer. But most of the butterflies that we see actually in Maryland are ones that are just migrating through. They were born in the north, um, in southern uh, Canada and up in the northeast and they're flying through our yards on their way all the way to get to Mexico. So when they get to Mexico they overwinter in trees um, and this entire tree looks like this because it's just filled with butterflies. So I've got like a close-up of what those individual branches look like with the weight of all the butterflies. So the monarchs really are just like the um, wildebeest in terms of like the massive migrations that they go on in order to um, you know survive in the winter and then return to visitors next summer. And there's other caterpillars that you know maybe don't look as attractive as our monarch ones do but every caterpillar in your yard is important and it's really hard to tell when you look at the caterpillar what it might turn into. So this one actually going to become one of our hummingbird moths um, and I you know, really uh, enjoy watching these moths uh, so they're the clearing moths and they you know uh, are called often hummingbird moths because of the way we, they feed so I just have a little video clip of that So they um, hover in front of the flowers just like uh, hummingbirds do. Okay, so we've discussed the plant, the animals that you're probably trying to attract to your yard, but as I said, other ones are going to show up. And some of the ones that are going to cause the most issues um, for a lot of gardeners can be aphids, um, which can you know, become quite numerous on plants, stink bugs, flea beetle, beetles, which I've been doing a number on my uh, coneflowers because I'll eat the petals, and then lace wing, lace bugs, sorry, um, which are really bad on my asters. The last couple of years I've had really bad infestations of those. And then things like the looper um, caterpillars here, which has actually disguised itself. It's pulled off little bits of the flower and stuck it all over itself so it looks just like the flower. Um, so they have some pretty cool camouflage techniques to uh, keep themselves safe from predators. But luckily, we have, as soon as you have all these tasty snacks turn up in your uh, pollinator garden, <clears throat> it's also become, going to become incredibly appealing for animals that want to eat those. And the natural balances will mean that these predators start to turn up soon. So the lions are going to come and eat some of all of those, you know, like herbivores that are busy eating. So you probably know that uh, ladybugs are well known for eating aphids. Oops, sorry. But in reality, it's the aphid larvae, which have a lot, much more kind of uh, just ancient looking kind of animals. Uh, so it's the larvae that tend to eat many more of the aphids than the adults themselves. Um, the ant aphid lion down here with its huge jaws is better known by its adult form as well, which is like lace wings here. So, named obviously after those amazing wings. So the aphid lions are just like the most incredible animals to have and be able to watch in your pollinator garden. So if you imagine, most, so as you have plants, you're going to have large numbers of aphids start to build up um, that are, you know, just sucking the juice out of your plants. And because aphids drink so much plant sap, they actually have to exude 
tons of that sap just at straight back out of their body. Um, we give it the euphemism of honeydew. So it's a sweet liquid is like comes out, you know, from them. And some animals that are really attracted to that sweet liquid, and it's actually ants. And ants will uh, take care of flocks of aphids and they actually milk the aphids by coming along and stroking them so they exude this sweet honeydew they drink the honeydew and the ant will protect their flock of aphids from any predators so if you are somebody that wants to eat these uh, aphids, you actually have to deal with this very tough, vicious, protective uh, shepherd who's looking after his flock. But the ant lions have come up with an amazing system for overcoming the ant. So what they do is, um, instead of just like walking around like this ant lion and like grabbing the aphids with those jaws and just sucking all the juice out themselves a lot of them um if they're eating an aphid they suck all the juice out of the aphid and then the remaining like carcass of the dried out shell really of the uh, aphid they actually take and they throw it onto their back and they keep covering themselves with all the exoskeletons of the uh, aphids so then if an ant comes along and touches the bit onto this um you know the back of the uh, lava here what it's going to think is like, oh, this is just a big uh, aphid. And so it'll leave it alone because the whole animal smells like an aphid. So this is a, a wolf, as it were, that has actually put on the clothing. And so it's like a wolf dressed in uh, sheep's clothing. And you can still see, though, those big jaws right down at the bottom when they're going to grab any aphids that they find. I have a little video here of one of these. So pretty hardcore covering yourself in the bodies of your victims. Uh, if you're going outside, like I said, looking for um, bees as I am, then you start to see other things going on, like these incredibly uh, ugly looking, um, kind of like a caterpillar, but really kind of like a grub. And these are actually the larvae of uh, other animals that come to your pollinator garden. And this is another larvae that loves to eat aphids. And some of them actually specialize on the oleander aphids, which are the bright yellow ones, which if you do try and grow swamp milkweed in particular, you probably know exactly the aphid that I am talking about. So what are these? ugly bugs well they're the larvae of surfeit flies um, also known as flower flies and these are the bee wannabes so if you're a fly you can't sting like a bee and you don't even have a you know, mouth that you can really bite with so you're fairly defenseless from predators so most of the flower flies actually mimic bees and wasps because if you look like something that can sting then maybe you know a potential predator is going to ignore you and leave you behind and you can see how convincing some of these ones are and they do have incredibly good mimicry of some of our different um bees and wasps such that you can actually pick out which species that they're trying to um uh, mimic but all of these as adults they do go to flowers and just drink nectar it's just the young that eat aphids so when they're visiting flowers 
they themselves can get really covered in pollen. So you can see this particular fly, and you know it's a fly and not a bee. And I have seen this picture be used um, as a, oh, here's a bee doing its job. Um, so it's a pretty famous picture, this one, because it was used you know, by a um, environmental organization for a Save the Bee campaign. But it's quite obviously, once you know what to look for, a fly, because it has big fly eyes and little tiny fly antenna. And that's the way that we tell the difference between a bee and a fly, is bees have long antenna and flies have very short antenna. So you can see these huge eyes that pretty much meet in the middle and those little tiny antenna. So you don't need to get fooled by any of these bee wannabes once you know the trick to tell them apart. OK, so who takes care of those stink bugs? Well, there's a whole load of assassin bugs out in your yard whose job it is is to eat things like stink bugs. And these, if you were small enough to be um, attacked by the, these assassin bugs, you would find them pretty scary because these are an insect that come with a built in like switch blade. So they have a piercing proboscis. So their tongue has a very sharp point that they can stab into insects and they keep it hinged back out of the way most of the time. But when they want to eat an animal, um, they just like flick that out and stab it straight in. So I have a little video. <laughs> I'm starting to feel like uh, David Attenborough at this point. So we're about to see, you know, an animal being stalked, just so you know. But I tried to pick something that you wouldn't get too upset about being eaten. Um, so the animal is actually a um, uh, one of our moth caterpillars with a and as you're going to see in just a minute when I play, here we go. And I'm going to fast forward it just a little bit um, because it takes quite a long time for this wheel bug. Um, it has like the shape like cogs on its back, which is why this one's the wheel bug, to actually decide when it's safe to attack. Because those spines, you know, are very sharp and a lot of them have, um, you know, tits on them that are, are poisonous so that they protect the animal so he's like keeps circling around to decide when it's going to be time so i'm going to fast forward him just a little bit because it does take the wheel bug a really long time to decide whether it's going to be safe to attack this caterpillar Yikes. Yep. <laughs> and that's how it goes if you're a caterpillar. Life is pretty tough in the pollinator garden. Yeah. Did the caterpillar not know or just is too slow to do anything about it? Yeah, it's too slow. It's it's too there's slow. nothing yeah. it can do. That's what all those, you know, the uh, hairs on its body or its entire yeah. defense system and the oh, colors boy. that it has is warning you that you know those hairs have got you know poisons within them so that if you get pierced by them they're gonna make you sick too so the birds wow. will leave those ones are wet alone but the stink bug um because if i go back to the picture um, their actual bodies and exoskeleton, so those hairs, you know, were not getting in it, although it was trying to, you know, maneuver itself so it didn't get uh, struck by the hairs. Um, but once it's pierced with the, um, uh, you know, it's proboscis and it's pierced into it, it's just going to suck all the insides out. Oh. <laughs> Caterpillar. <laughs> <laughs> so it won't get affected by the hairs. Oh so the hairs work really well 
for against an animal like a bird that's going to eat the whole of you but they won't protect you from something no. like a stink bug so these are um, some someone's bugs. asking will the wheel bugs kill monarch caterpillars too yeah or assassin bugs same type mm -hmm. yeah and um so one of the things i mean I, obviously, I keep trying to use the words like checks and balances, and we all love monarch butterflies. Um, as people, we would often wish that every single monarch baby could grow up to be a monarch adult. It seems like this really great idea, except every monarch mom can lay between 350 and 700 eggs. So if she does lay 700, then there's going to be 350 daughters if they all lived. And every year, the first generation of monarchs that come up, they lay 350 daughters. And then those 350 daughters would all lay another 350 each. Those would be the granddaughters. And all of those would lay another 350 each. If they all lived, there'd be over 4 billion um descendants from that one first mom and that's why they can't all live because if they did the world would be covered you'd be walking across monarchs that'd be they'd cover every surface of the earth in a single generation of them to, you know if they did that so that's they have lots and lots of babies because there are lots of predators out there and that's you know part of life for being a caterpillar is you get eaten by lots of different predators okay so if you remember i mentioned another of the bugs that's like I have to admit does irritate me if you try in the springtime and grow certain crops uh you know what these flea beetles are they're the little black things that like jump and they will cut holes in your plants so you get like shot holes in the leaves of them that can be really bad in vegetable gardens but i also have problems with them attacking like the coneflower petals so i have petalless flowers so who is the control for these beetles if you're learning anything at this point you know there's somebody that's going to eat them and in comparison to um the wheel bugs that we've just seen maybe the wheel bugs are the nice animals because they just grab you and kill you unfortunately if you are a beetle your end could be way worse because most of the things that control beetle populations are actually um, tachnid flies, which are a type of parasitic fly. So these flies um, actually will lay their eggs on these beetles and their young grow inside of these beetles and kill them. So all these different flies that you will see all over your flowers, because the adults eat the pollen, um, their young are actually eating beetles. There are predatory stink bugs as well. Not all stink bugs are vegetarians that are like eating and destroying our crops. They, there are ones like this soldier um, bug that uh, have the piercing proboscis that will also eat a lot of our beetle species. So just to like give you an illustration of the checks and balances that can go on. Um, this is my mailbox at my house. And as you can see, I planted native plants around it. So it became a very attractive place for carpenter beetles, bees, sorry, carpenter bees. They um, you know, were drilling holes into the cedar post which is lovely soft wood so easy for them to drill um, and kept laying more and more eggs inside it and because it was right next to the um driveway i think it really put off a lot of predators from coming to get at the insects as you will see so after a couple of years my mailbox post actually looked like this and was just full of holes to the point that we were worried that the whole mailbox was going to collapse so in the winter when all the baby carpenter bees were fast asleep 
um, we actually dug out this mail, this uh, the post, and just put a new post on, um, and moved this post into the middle of one of my pollinator beds because I was kind of fascinated to see what would happen next. And what happened was. During that winter, because it was no longer next to the road, I had the first opportunity to actually photograph hairy woodpeckers that came and drilled out. You can see there's a pair, a male and a female here, um, and they would be, um, you know, enlarge those holes to get at the uh, bee larva that were overwintering inside those holes. So I'm sure they had a pretty major impact on my carpenter bee population. You can see, like, really having a great time pulling out the, the big, fat, juicy larva to help them through this early spring period. Then that summer, I was looking and I saw this creature sitting outside of one of the holes as well. And this is another of the tachnid flies. So this is a fly that specializes on parasitizing carpenter bees. So it goes inside the holes and lays its eggs in there and then its young eat the young of the carpenter bees. So I still have a very healthy population of carpenter bees, um, but now maybe it is a little bit in more balance. I don't have like an overwhelming number of carpenter bees as I did, and I had some very happy woodpeckers, so it all worked out. Okay, so another bug that's been irritating me are the lace bugs because they really you know, suck all the juices out of my asters. So just as I'm expecting to have some really nice displays of New York, uh, New England asters and stuff, they will start to look a bit sad. And the animals that control um, lace bugs tend to actually be teeny tiny animals that are very hard to spot. And these are very tiny parasitic wasps. Um, you can see how much this picture has been enlarged. These are the hairs on the leaf um, that you can see. So there's a whole series of parasitic wasps that very much specialize on attacking just one or two species because you have to like time your life cycles to match the life cycle of the animal that you attack. So there are ones that parasitize aphids, ones that parasitize eggs, and probably the best known one is the ones that parasitize the tobacco hornworms. A lot of you might have seen pictures like this with the um, cocoons of the, the parasitic wasps on that caterpillar that yet again got eaten. The parasitic wasps really can be absolutely tiny. They're actually the tiniest animal on the planet that, that can fly. So there's multicellular animals that are less than the width of four hairs. Um, but in their, le in their total length, is less than the width of four hairs. So as you can see, it takes a microscopic picture to, to be able to see these animals. Um, and these Wasps parasitize the eggs of other very tiny insects, but it's all part of controlling uh, populations. And of all the things in your yard, parasitic wasps are actually controlling populations more than any other animal. And those parasitic wasps also have to watch out because there are parasites that parasitize them. And it's so complicated that most of these connections we don't even know. But um, this particular one has been studied because uh, most of you who've ever grown cabbage know that the big problem is those cabbage white um, butterflies. Their caterpillars will like destroy your cabbage populations. So, um, you know, people are excited about um, the fact that there's a parasitic wasp that parasitizes these caterpillars and helps to control them, but then we're less excited to discover that there's a parasitic wasp that parasitizes the wasp that parasitizes the cabbage uh, caterpillar. Because, of course, this one reduces the population of the one that we want to reduce the population of the caterpillars. So it's the friend, the enemy of my friend. <laughs> It's my enemy kind of thing. So, um, and we actually think that there may there are times when there are parasites that parasite the hyperparasites. So there's just layers among le on layers of complexity. <laughs> but those tiny wasps, you 
probably never even notice in your yard unless you really pay attention. The wasps that you are going to see are these bigger wasps that have come to feed again on the nectar. But these parasitic wasps, these wasps, sorry, um, aren't parasites. They, you know, go off and catch prey, which they um, actually parasite. Uh, paralyze and then store to feed to their young. So the blue-winged scolid wasp over here should make you very happy to vi be visiting your uh, flowers in your pollinator garden if you have grass because they parasitize like all the chafer bugs and June bugs and Japanese uh, beetle bugs that live in the grass and eat the grass roots. So you'll see them actually flying over your grass um, hunting for uh, those beetles to, paras to catch them and take them back to feed to their young. Um, this is a sand wasp um, that you'll see as well. Um, and they like to eat stink bugs. So they will grab them and haul them off to feed to their young. Now, remember there were some in between things, things that are sometimes good and sometimes bad. And one of them is definitely the crab spiders, the ones with these huge legs that use them to grab their prey. So they don't build webs. It's all about the grabbing with these crab spiders. And they can be absolutely tiny, as you can see by the enlargement of this picture. Uh, we have, it's really common to find either yellow or white uh, crab spiders. And these, this one's actually the same species. They can come in either of these two colors um, and they adapt their color to whatever flower that they're on so that they're better camouflaged. And sitting on those flowers, they're going to grab anything that comes to visit those flowers. And it might be a foe, such as um, the flat house fly that I've grabbed here, or it might be a friend that's like, for them, it's all food. But it's kind of amazing how much the prey, how much bigger than them the prey can be, but they are very strong and will not be put off by a bigger uh, victim. Um, other wasps that you might see in your pollinator patch are these incredible mud dauber wasps that have a really, really cool shape. I just love the uh, sort of very um, ladylike flowing um, abdomens that they have. So you might see them on your flowers drinking nectar, or you might see them if you have any mud, collecting mud, because they use those to make these little pots. So this one is the potter wasp. Um, and inside the pot is where they put all the things that they've collected for their young and then their young grow safe inside there. The mud the wasps, um, these ones with a very skinny waist, um, they are the ones that can make those long um, chambers to put their young in. So this is like the mud dauber organ. Uh, organ pipe and mud dauber that does this style of one. And if you cut open these chambers, what you're going to find is that most of them are like stuffed with prey. And particularly for the organ pipe mud dauber, their victims are actually all spiders. So if you don't like spiders, maybe you like these wasps because they are very good at hunting them down to feed to their young. There's even one of the species that specializes on finding black widow spiders. And so they'll just hunt your whole yard for the black widow spiders. And although wasps have a really bad reputation, these wasps are actually really friendly. If you look up mud, blue mud dauber spiders, blue mud dauber wasps on Wikipedia, one of my favorite things is it says like they're very um, placid it's hard to get them to sting. And if you do want them to sting, you have to like grab them and squeeze their abdomens. So as long as you're not squeezing any wasp behinds, then um, you should be fairly safe from these ones ever stinging you. But unfortunately, there are some wasps that are well known for being a nuisance and it's the social wasps. Um, in Maryland, we have about 1,200 species of wasp, and only four types of the wasps are the social wasps, paper wasps, yellow jackets, um, the bald-faced hornets, 
and the European hornets are the only ones that like are social and will defend their nests. Now away from their nests, most of these wasps are also very placid, but if you get too close to the wasps, the nest they will defend. Um, but these wasps take out huge number of caterpillars and other pre uh, items from your yard. So they, you know, really a major part of controlling insect populations. But as we mentioned before, sometimes it's insects that we like that they're going to take. So um, unfortunately, I've seen this a lot of times. It's the uh, monarch caterpillar ones that they will take to eat. But even for these wasps, there's an animal out there to control them. So robber flies, a very big fly that is very fast. And this one's a, called a hanging thief because it hangs by one leg while it's eating its victim. And you can see it's having a yellow jacket here. So a lot of these robber flies will eat the larger wasps. So who is the king of the jungle in your flower patch? Well, unfortunately, probably the largest predator, you know, for in the, on, of all the insects is this, the praying mantis. And because people didn't believe in the predators that I just explained to you, all those different ones that will control um, insects in your yard, people have brought a non-native praying mantis to America and like let them go. And these praying mantis are actually very large and they can take out much larger prey than, you know, is kind of the balance for a pollinator garden. So a praying mantis, these are Asian play, Chinese praying mantis actually can catch and eat hummingbirds. That's like how big their prey is. And I often see them eating adult monarch uh, butterflies as well. Now I just wanted to finish with a very strange, which is a canopid fly. So the canopic fly is a fly that's pretending so hard to be a wasp. It's so pretending so hard that it's even given itself like a little wasp waist. Can you see? And if you remember, I told you that you can tell a wasp fly from a wasp because they only have short antenna. But this wasp fly actually has a long pedestal and then puts its antenna on the end of the pedestal so that its antenna look long, so that it could be a wasp. It's really trying hard to be a wasp. But if you're a bumblebee, you never want to come across one of these canopid flies because what they do is they catch bumblebees in midair. They actually use a very sharp end on their abdomen to open up the side of a bumblebee and they lay their eggs inside the bumblebee. Those larva eggs hatch, a larva comes out, the larva emits chemicals which take over the brain of a bumblebee and make the bumblebee go to the ground, dig a little hole and bury itself in its own little grave so that the canopid fly larva can safely hatch under the ground. So there are zombies out there if you're a bumblebee. So just really quickly, I want to show you what can be going on in your yard. So if you plant a um, eastern columbine like this, you might have hummingbirds come to pollinate it, but you'll almost certainly have a leaf miner come and eat your leaves, they actually live between the upper and lower layer of the leaf, uh, squeezing through to eat inside of that leaf, really safe from any predator. Who could find you inside of a leaf? Of course. So here's the little fly that's like laying the eggs to be inside those leaves. There is a parasitic wasp, a teeny tiny wasp that spe specializes in parasitizing those leaf miners. It has this um, a long ovipositor so it can go through the leaf and actually put its eggs inside of that leaf miner. But if you're on a leaf looking for leaf miners, it makes you very vulnerable. Little tiny jumping spiders that are going to catch you and eat you. And if you're a little tiny jumping spider, then you have to watch out because there's some really big, scary jumping spiders that will jump on you and eat you. 
But of course, we already know if you're a spider, there are muddle the wasps out there trying to find you to catch you and take you, put them in their little mud uh, daubed uh, house where they're going to lay their eggs for their young. And their larvae are going to grow big and fat on all those, all those wasps and they're going to be the perfect winter tree for our tufted titmouse. If you ever look at all these mud dober homes, lots of them in the winter time have gotten broken open by nut hatchers who know how tasty those uh, wasp larvae inside are. So, as I said, um, we tend to just focus on the animals that we like and the animals we want to attract, but in reality, as soon as you plant flowers, you're starting an ecosystem and you're going to have all of this amazing life going on in your yard. And I'm hoping I made it sound interesting enough to you that you can understand that even animals that we might not like and might not want in our yard are actually a really important part of that whole web of life. And if we want to support things like tufted titmouse, it takes a whole lot of other smaller animals to like make enough food to feed them through the winter time. Okay, so oh, just managed to make it for the hour. Um, so I was just going to see if anyone had any questions. Thank you so much, Claire. A lot of excitement going on in our gardens. <laughs> you know about <laughs> even some very violent things. <laughs> I know it's like a um, it's sort of like a planet Earth documentary going on right in your uh, flower patch, and we you think you've got to go all the way to Africa to see all that drama, but I can promise you it's happening every day in your yard. So. Yeah, it, it's so important to have that balance. Though I was recently in Italy and at a winery, and um, they don't use any pesticides there because. You, you know, the winemaker said everything's in perfect balance here. There's no need for it. Yeah, so, that is a and nice I, thing. Do you think that's why we have so many ticks right now? Because things are out of balance. Yep. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, you know, our large herbivore. <laughs> So our deer, uh, you know, out of balance um, because we've taken away their natural predators. Um, and so that has a lot of repercussions. The deer yeah. eat a lot of plants that, um, you know, now are missing from our landscapes. Um, and their numbers are so high that it just really allows tick numbers to expand and, you know, keep, keep going up. And then, other things that eat ticks, so things like possums, you know, will eat an awful lot of ticks, but unfortunately, oh, I didn't know that. Possums, I know like, I've heard about chickens. Yeah. So possums mm. are the same that they just because they kind of low slang, they're walking through the undergrowth and they're, they're just getting a lot of ticks jumping on them, but they just groom and eat them all. Um, but things like possums are not well adapted to modern life and cars. So, you know, the populations of those kind of suffer from not being well adapted to crossing roads. Well, hopefully um, people watching programs like this are interested in planting more and bringing back some of that diversity into yes. our neighborhoods. I know, because one of the things um, that can happen is if you too quickly see bugs and rush out there with a spray um, mm. to like, spray them away what happens is you might kill the some of those bugs but you'll also kill a lot of their predators a lot of the time so any of the uh you know aphids or whatever that don't get sprayed when they start to reproduce again they can actually explode in numbers because you've gotten rid of all the animals that were previously keeping them in uh -huh. check so um like so your uh, advice is just to let it be and things will balance out eventually. Yeah, I mean, um, sometimes I do intervene occasionally, but I try and do it in ways that don't, you know, impact. So I do have problems with those yellow oleander aphids that will get on your swamp milkweed. Um, 
but I, if I can, I sometimes I'll just use a water jet and just like kind of jet them off. But I also try and keep an eye on them because I know they're so vulnerable to them. And if you let it start to build up, the numbers can build up very quickly. So as soon as I see them, I will get a damp cloth and actually just wipe them off with a damp cloth. And then if I do that a couple of times, I notice the populations just never build up really high. So it's like knocking them back when there's not many of them has really worked for me. Um, there's a comment, uh, but there is a big reaction to the invasive spotted lanternfly. Are you seeing them there? Um, so we're um, where I work just north of Baltimore, we're starting to get a few. We don't have the really huge numbers yet. I know Harford County, which is just to our north, um, this year seems to have the explosion in numbers. So it's, it's really difficult because every time a new invasive kind of comes in like this, it does tend to mean that people get really worried and use a lot of chemicals to try and knock them back. So um, we, you know, treatments for that we brought in to try and control gypsy moth are still having repercussions in the environment because they kind of went so crazy in how much um, how much they did to try and control gypsy moth. Even with the even the bags that people used, um, bad too. <clears throat> yeah, well, one of the things they did was they introduced a one of the those parasitic wasps that I talked about that lay their eggs on an animal and then they eat the animal. Uh, they introduced a parasitic wasp to try and control gypsy moths, but they didn't test wow. it well enough because this was back in the 1940s and it actually eats a lot of native uh, moths. I and mean, it's actually our silk moths. So the really pretty moths that it goes after. So the lunar moths and the Cecropia and the Polyphemus and the populations of those have plummeted um, because I think the parasitic wasp they introduce actually attacks them more than it does gypsy moth. So. Yeah, it really is a delicate balance, as they say. Mm -hmm. Overdo things and tip it. Very I'm hoping that after anyone that watched this today is going to go out either tomorrow or at the weekend and have a poke around your flowers and see if you can see any of the uh, things going on as you're suddenly like oh my gosh look <laughs> there's <laughs> one of those ladybug lava and like that there's one of those ant lions so. well for those of you who have watched the program um please if you have any questions let us know but i do want you to know that it's being recorded and it will be posted on the Loudoun County Public Library YouTube page and please check Loudoun County Public Library's website library.loudon.gov for other gardening programs. Um, there's a lot of them and soon your yard will be full of flowers and insects all working happily together. <laughs> but no, we really do have a lot of great programs. And um, BJ, if you don't mind coming on for just a second and letting people know how they might contact um, the Loudon County Wildlife Conservancy. Are you there, BJ? Hi. Hi, BJ. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. But yes, uh, thank you for working with us at Loudon Wildlife Conservancy to host this. Thank you so much, Claire. You're always a joy to listen to. Um, but we have other events on our website at uh, loudonwildlife.org, um, and we have some events coming up this weekend or anytime you might. Uh, so check, um, we have volunteer programs if you wanna help with habitat restoration activities, things like that. So yeah. please, please visit us and check out our events and activities. Lots of ways to get involved with nature. Thanks, BJ. Yeah. All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. Claire, we can't thank you enough for providing this education to us and for all the good work that you do. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you for having me.